it's wonderful to uh, to be here uh, joining you on Zoom today. And uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, very excited to be talking to you again and to have this opportunity. So today we're going to be exploring the quantum world together. And in particular, seeing how the quantum world of tiny particles that make up everything in our universe uh, is very mysterious. It's very strange. Things behave very differently to what we experience in our everyday lives. For example, if you're uh, shooting a basketball, that basketball is uh, made up of atoms. These are quantum objects, objects of the quantum world. And yet atoms behave nothing like basketballs and basketballs behave nothing like atoms. So we're going to explore how our world, our universe comes about from these tiny particles. And you will see that physics is all about discovering uh, the laws of nature, the physical laws that govern everything in the universe and finding new ways to imagine problems, imagine processes and how things work in, in totally different ways, problems that may at first seem impossible. And so that's why I've titled this talk, How Physicists Imagine the Unimaginable. So before we get started, I'll just give a, an introduction to uh, what I do now. Uh, so I uh, completed uh, my bachelor's degree studying physics in Canberra, studying at ANU. And now I'm in Europe, uh, in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, I'm studying at ETH Zurich, which is the Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland. And uh, it's this big building just here. This is where I'm currently studying. And I'm focusing on particle physics. Particle physics, as I just described before, is, is really about the tiniest things in our universe, the most basic uh, particles that make up everything we see around us. And this is one place where we can uh, try to learn new things about how the universe works. This is the Large Hadron Collider. And so as part of my studies, I'm currently working on one of the four main experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Next year, I'll also uh, continue to explore the um, how particles work at, at a different facility, which is in the countryside, uh, just near Zurich, where I am now. Uh, the Swiss countryside is, is very beautiful and green, as you can see. And uh, along the river here, there is a facility that has many particle accelerators. Particle accelerators are very exciting because we take tiny particles and smash them together to see what happens if anything new pops out. We can also create all kinds of uh, strange particles and, and study uh, how they behave. Do they behave differently to, um, to other particles? So you can see some of the accelerators here. This one shaped like a donut is uh, creates a special kind of light that can be used to study new materials. There's a, another accelerator over here, a big line through the forest. Uh, and in this big white building here is a very fancy machine, a very fancy particle accelerator, which I was fortunate to work on in 2018 when I visited uh, this uh, Paul Scherer Institute as part of my studies at ANU. And this is where the particle accelerator begins. This is where um, we, the, the particles begin their journey, very, very moving very slowly in this kind of mad scientist looking apparatus. And then they enter um, this region here and they go or fly around in circles until they are traveling really, really, really fast. And then we can do all sorts of exciting experiments with these fast moving particles. So nuclear physics and particle physics are very exciting. We can do many things like search for dark matter. We can uh, use beams of particles to treat cancer. We can use particle accelerators to find traces of, of radioactive elements and therefore learn something uh, from ice cores about 
the history of the Earth's climate, to learn what the Earth was like millions of years ago. We can also test satellites before they launch, and uh, this will be a big operation at ANU in the near future. So this means putting a satellite that's been built into a particle accelerator beam and simulating space, basically, to see how does this, how will this satellite survive in space so that we can make sure that it's made of strong materials that will withstand the harsh environment and radiation out in space. We can also use uh, our knowledge of nuclear processes, fusion and fission to generate clean energy to solve uh, the problems that uh, Manik described, uh, I think, one, one month ago with uh, the Young Stars program. We can also investigate the origin of the elements. So a very famous uh, scientist of the 20th century, Carl Sagan, once said that uh, we are all stardust. And this means that we are made up of elements, our, our bodies, the earth, every, all of the uh, elements that we see around us came from stars. They were formed in the core of stars in outer space, which is, is um, quite exciting. And we can learn lots about that process from nuclear physics. Particle physics is also solving the mysteries of the universe, such as why our universe is made of matter. Uh, much more than antimatter. You might have heard of this antimatter. It's got all the opposite properties to matter, and yet uh, there's so little of it in the universe, and we don't know why. But nuclear and particle physics, at, it, at their core, are really about understanding the building blocks of matter. How does the universe work? What is everything made of? Everything we see around us. And so this is what we'll be discussing today, exploring the quantum world. And before we jump in, I want to put this question to you. Give me your ideas in the chat. What, what do you think are the building blocks of matter? What, what uh, do you think of when you hear the building blocks of matter? Um, send through any ideas that you have, have in the chat. So what kinds of atoms, cells, protons and neutrons, energy? These, these are great examples of tiny constituents, quarks, strings. Energy is a great one. Energy is uh, flowing through the universe and it's an important property of all, uh, all these other objects that uh, people have uh, described, quarks, leptons, bosons. This is, this is very exciting. So we're going to see many of these, uh, these players of the quantum world, these tiny particles like quarks and electrons, protons, neutrons. We will meet those very soon. So thanks for your input. That's great. Oh, even, and we've got some glue ones there as well. That's great. So uh, before we visit those tiny particles, we need to uh, come up with a way to describe and keep track of the distance scale. So how small are these particles? It's, it's hard to get a sense of how small they really are. So we're going to start our journey, not in the quantum world, but in the classical world. So what you see here is basically a garden. You can see these leaves and the, the size of our view here, this circle, is about one meter across. And so we're going to keep track of distances as they get smaller on this number line here. So we start with this little tick is a, what is one meter? And then the next tick is going 10 times smaller. So 10 times smaller than a meter is 10 centimeters. 10 times smaller again is one centimeter. And 10 times smaller again is one millimeter. So it's a thousand millimeters in one meter. So let's put a dot here at one meter. This is where we're starting in this garden. 
If we look a little bit closer at the leaf, an individual leaf, we can see a bit more detail. We can see that there's some interesting structure to the leaf, that leaves are not uh, simple objects. They have all these uh, radiating patterns out from the center. So we can learn something by zooming in by a factor of 10. If we want to zoom in by a factor of 10 again, then we probably want to use a microscope. So here we get this nice view uh, about one centimeter across of these tiny little droplets sitting on the surface of the leaf. So then if we zoom in further to about one millimeter across, we see that uh, the surface of the leaf is not, not exactly smooth. It's actually got lots of uh, tiny components in this kind of honey honeycomb pattern. So zooming in 10 times again, we get to a scale 100 micrometers. So this is 10 times smaller than one millimeter. So smaller than the, 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 uh, the very smallest gap on a, on a ruler. So this is what we see. And these are the individual cells of the, the plant cells of the leaf. So they all sort of squash together and with a waxy covering to create the surface of the leaf. And somebody mentioned earlier that uh, cells are indeed uh, one of the examples of, of what makes up life. Every, a lot of things we see around us on the earth. So this is how we keep track of the distances. We've zoomed in by a factor of 10 four times to get to this uh, this distance of 100 micrometers. But we're still a long way from the quantum world, which starts at around one nanometer. So we need to get down to the scale of one nanometer before we start to see things behaving according to uh, quantum physics. So we started our journey in the garden, zoomed in by a factor of 10 four times to get to 100 micrometers. So I'm going to uh, put a question to you now. How many more times do we need to zoom in by a factor of 10 before we reach the quantum world starting at this scale of one nanometer? So here are four options. And hopefully you can see a poll on your screen now. So I invite you to select which you think is correct. There we go. So uh, almost uh, everyone got it correct that uh, we need to zoom in by a factor of 10, starting from this point, 100 micrometers, zoom in by 10, one, two, three, four, five times to get down to this scale of one nanometer. Uh, some of the uh, other options uh, were uh, nine times, which is indeed, we would need to zoom in by a factor of 10, nine times if we started at one meter. And so this scientific notation that you see at the bottom, uh, if we're at one nanometer, which is 10 to the minus nine meters, this minus nine means zooming in by 10, nine, nine times from one meter. So now that we've reached the quantum world, what do we find? Obviously not apples, but indeed, uh, let's start from this point and ask what is the apple made of? So it's about here on the number line, it's about 10 centimeters across. So apples are very sweet because they have sugar. Sugar is a molecule produced by life. And um, this is what it looks like. So a molecule is a collection of different kinds of atoms. So the sugar will have carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms, all put together in this very nice arrangement. And so this is on the scale of one nanometer. So this is where we start to see quantum effects. 
if we zoom in on one of these atoms, this is uh, a, a model of the atom, which is, and atoms are typically about 100 picometers uh, across, so it's about 10 times smaller than a typical molecule or a sugar molecule. And so the atom has a center, which we call the nucleus, and buzzing around the nucleus are all of these electrons. And we don't know of anything that the electron is made up of anything else. It seems to be a fundamental particle, so something very, very small. But the nucleus, uh, zoomed in here, this is about 10 femtometers across. It is made up of these protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are about one femtometer wide. And they are also composed of uh, smaller things, smaller things called quarks that are inside the protons and neutrons. And so they're uh, buzzing around inside the protons and neutrons, but all bound together. So uh, these are you, uh, everybody uh, who responded in the chat covered uh, these particles of the quantum world. And so in order to explore the mysteries of the, the quantum world, we are going to look at the double slit experiment. So I'll introduce what this experiment is and how it uh, reveals some of these mysteries uh, in a little while. But first, we need to think about what actually is a particle, because I've used the word particle many times already. And so, you know, it's something, something very small, something that makes up the world. Um, but what, what is it really? So I'm going to launch another poll and here we go. Hopefully you can see the poll now and uh, select which you think only contains particles. So if you see something in the list that, that you don't think is a particle, not, not that option. Okay, so we've got uh, distribution across all four responses, which is great, because it is, uh, there are some interesting uh, aspects to the list, which we'll talk about. Okay, so in the poll, now uh, most people selected this one, option C. And indeed, option C is particles that we don't know of anything smaller, anything inside them. This is so the electron, we don't know of anything inside that. Up and down quarks, we don't know of anything smaller than the quark. Um, the nucleus in option B, this is made up of protons and neutrons. So uh, it is a collection of, of other things. And, and maybe for that reason, uh, it's not a fundamental particle, but in some ways it could still be considered a particle. So does anybody have any ideas? What is a particle? What really defines a particle? What properties does it have? Why, why is an apple not a particle or a bottle of water? Send, send through your ideas in the, in the chat. This example, dust. So dust is indeed a, a very small thing and it comes together to form larger objects, to form what we see in the world around us. So in some ways, dust is like a particle. Water, water has helium, so water has, has something smaller inside it. Can't be broken down any further, no more breaking apart. This is a great, uh, great point. So I've got an apple right here. So this apple, it's a, it's a small solid object, uh, but indeed I can take a bite out of it. So I've just broken down this apple into something smaller. It's still an apple, right? It's just got a bite out of it. 
but it's it's something smaller. It's it's a little bit lighter because it, uh, I've taken a bite out, so I've broken it down. So that's uh, why we say we don't really think of an apple as a particle because we can easily take a bite and break it down into something smaller. With the bottle of water as well, the same idea. I can take a, a sip out of the water. And now it's not as full as it was before. And it's a little bit lighter because there's less water in there now. So I've broken it down. But the other important thing about particles is that if I have a second bottle of water, I can pour more water into the original bottle. And you can see now it's, it's full to the top. So it's much heavier than it was before. So I've added something to the bottle of water. So it's been in, a, in the particle uh, description, we've excited the particle because we've made it heavier. We've added energy to the particle. And so it was very easy for me to do that. And so that's why we don't think of a bottle of water as a particle because we can break it down by taking a sip or add more water, exciting it. So um, this is why we wouldn't think of those as particles, but the same idea applies to these quantum objects as well. So the apple, uh, anybody can take a bite and break it down, but molecules are a little bit harder to break apart. So, but if we are cooking food, so we're adding heat, we're changing the structure of the food, changing the molecules. And also by doing chemistry experiments, we can change molecules. If we want to break down atoms, then uh, one way of doing this is to use a laser, which you might find in a physics laboratory. So uh, this is a little bit harder to access. And so if all your you're just cooking in your kitchen, you can think of the atom as a particle because you can't really break it apart um, or excite it with more energy. Uh, you need a laser to be able to do that. And then taking another step, if you want to break apart the nucleus or excite the nucleus with more energy, make it wobble and, and twist in certain ways, then you need a particle accelerator like the one that sits at the southern end of the ANU campus. This is only a 10 minute walk from where many of you attend young stars on a regular basis at the physics studio. And you can see some of the landmarks of Canberra in the background. So this, uh, this uh, tower contains a particle accelerator which uh, provides 15 million volts of electric charge. And so that's a lot of electricity, a lot of charge. And so it's very difficult to break down a nucleus. You need one of these particle accelerators. So if you're a chef or a chemist or uh, studying, studying atoms using lasers, you can think of the nucleus as a particle because it's too hard to break down. And then again, with protons and neutrons, in order to change them or turn them into different things, you need something like the Large Hadron Collider, which is at, at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, and it's a 27 kilometer ring. It covers uh, the, across the border of Switzerland and France. And uh, these are the four main experiments. So obviously it's very difficult to alter and excite protons and neutrons because you need this big particle accelerator. So for nuclear physicists, for atomic physicists, for chemists, for chefs, and for everyday life, we can easily think of protons and neutrons as particles. So the key message is that a uh, particle depends on how much energy you have to, to break it apart. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, what we can think of with, with the particles. Um, if we take a simpler example, a marble, imagine we have a wall, which is just here, and the wall has two holes in it, and we're shooting marbles at the wall, and they're flying through these holes. And so we uh, have the marbles hitting this screen behind the wall. 
And so we end up with a pile of marbles here and a pile of marbles here. So the further this extends in, in this direction of the arrow, it means that if this is very long, that many marbles hit the wall here uh, and fewer of them hit the wall here. And so we end up with these two piles of marbles. If we just had one hole in the wall or one slit, then we just get one peak. And the same if we only had this hole in the wall and we shoot marbles through it, we get one uh, pile of marbles directly behind the slit. So the key message is that for particles, such as uh, classical particles, such as marbles, the total uh, distribution or the total pattern that we see on this screen is adding together the first slit, this one, and the second slit, this one. So this is, this is what we should uh, expect from our everyday experience. We shoot marbles through the wall and they land somewhere behind the hole in the wall. The next thing we're going to do with this uh, double slit experiment, the two holes in the wall, is to send waves through the wall. And so uh, we're familiar with waves from the ocean. So if you consider this boat, which is anchored, so fixed in one position, the boat's gonna sit here and it's going to bob up and down as the waves move in this direction. So a moment later, the wave has moved and the, the boat rises with the wave. And then another moment later, the wave has moved even further. And so has the surfer and the boat is sitting quite low. So it's bobbed, bobbed down with the wave. If we consider the surface of this wave with this gray line, then there are a few words that we can use to describe waves. So the high points of the wave are the peaks of the wave and the low points are the valleys. And so we can use these words because it looks very much like a valley between two mountain peaks. The peak is the top of the mountain. The valley is the low point where you might have a river running through between the two mountains. If we measure the distance between the two peaks, then we get what is called the wavelength. And the other distance that's important is the height of the wave. So this is the distance from the, the middle uh, to the top of the peak. And so this, this wave height will be important for uh, our double slit experiment. So now we've been looking at the wave from the side like this, but how would a bird flying above, how would, how would it see the wave? Uh, so we consider a bird's eye view. And one way to um, help see the waves and understand the waves from above is to color the wave according to the height. So the valleys will color those in blue and the peaks will color those red. So now the bird can see that, see where the peak is because it will be red. And so now we start our double slit experiment with the waves. We have these waves hit, uh, flowing onto the wall the peaks in red, the valleys in blue. And so they, they hit the wall and some flows through, the, um, through this hole in the wall, the first slit, and we get this nice circular pattern. And you can see these points here, it's very dark red and very deep blue. This means that the waves are very, very, very big. But then if we look over here, further away from the hole in the wall, then it's sort of light colors. So this means that the waves are very, very small. And so if we measure the height of the wave at lots of positions along this purple screen, we can make a plot, which looks something like this. So 
the further the dot is in this direction, in the direction of this arrow, the larger the wave. So for example, this circle is a very large wave occurring at this position, which is pretty much just behind the hole in the wall. But if we go all the way over here, we see that it's only a very small wave at this position on the screen. And so we can color our, our plot or our pattern along the screen in yellow. And then also consider what happens if we have only this second slit. It's uh, pretty much the same case. We have the large waves with the dark red and the deep blue, uh, giving the, the largest waves right behind the slit. So green is the second slit, yellow is the first slit. So now I have a, another question for you. What do you think will happen if we have these waves? Again, red is the peak and blue is the valleys flowing towards the wall. They flow through both slits now. What do you think we will see for the pattern on the screen here at the purple screen? Um, so I will launch the poll. So what, what do you think? What is your prediction? And here's the reminder that this is what we saw with slit one. This is what we saw with slit two. Uh, lots of uh, people responding and uh, all options answered, which is, um, which is good because this is a, it's, the answer may surprise you. So there's something, something to learn when uh, our predictions are, whether they're right or wrong, there's always something to learn once we do an experiment and see what nature has to say. Okay, we have five more seconds. Okay, great. So, um, many options in particular for the first uh, A, which uh, looks a bit like the outline of both slits. So I think it uh, would be a reasonable prediction that we see something behind this slit one and, and something behind slit two. But when we do the experiment and look at nature, what we find is that uh, we get this very crazy bumpy pattern on the screen. And so uh, you see the here in the dark, dark red and deep blue, this is where the waves are from here and the waves from here are adding together. And so if we have one peak and another peak and we add them together, we get a really big peak. And if we get two valleys coming together, we get a very deep valley. But if we get a peak and a valley coming at the same place, then they add together and make the, say the water, the water flat, which is what's happening in these parts uh, where it's sort of white. And so that's why we see this dip uh, at this position on the screen, the, the water is pretty much flat because the waves from both are canceling out. Okay, so time for a quick demonstration. Well, uh, what I'm going to show you very briefly is that we can see these effects not just on the computer screen in a simulation, but we can also We can also see this for ourselves. So here I have a tray of water and what we were sending towards the wall was a series of waves. So if I move this uh, plastic in and out of the water, you can see the waves moving towards the other side of the tray. So that's what's going towards the wall in the double slit experiment. But we can also see if we create two points of, of ripples 
by dropping these coins into the water, you can see the ripples from each. And so just like in the simulation, we can add, uh, the, the waves add together to give very strange effects. So, I recorded this earlier. And you'll see it in slow motion here. So we're looking at how these waves from the ripples sum together. And taking a photo here and looking at this region, you can see that if you follow this particular uh, peak in the ripple from this coin, it's a circle going along here, but when it crosses over the ripples from the other coin, we see dark light, dark light, dark light. And so that's because it's adding together with the other ripples um, to change the height of the wave at these positions. And so we call that interference. So that's, uh, we, we can actually see these effects in a tray of water, uh, so as well as making a simulation. So now we have uh, to ask the question, what happens in the quantum world? What happens if we shoot an electron, a tiny particle, uh, we don't know of anything smaller than the electron. What happens if we shoot it at the wall with the two slits? So this would be on a very small scale, uh, two small slits. And we are asking the question, uh, Will it behave like the classical waves where we saw the bumpy pattern on the screen? Or will it behave like the classical particle where we get a pile of electrons falling at one spot here behind the slit and one spot here behind the slit? So uh, send through ideas in the chat if you, if you have a prediction. Okay, Somebody, some people saying both. Indeed. So let's find out. Yeah, it's, it's great to make a prediction and then see what happens. So the electron flies towards the wall, but oops, we didn't see which slit it went through. This is because these tiny particles, we can't just watch them like we would a marble rolling along the floor. We can't actually watch it at every single point uh, without changing it. What we can do is measure where it fell on the, on the screen back here. So this little point is where the electron hit and we can send another one through. And again, we don't know which slit it went through, but we find, oh, there, there the electron hit the, hit the screen. And if we send through more and more and more and more electrons, then, and, and only one at a time, electrons flying through the, the uh, two slits, then we get this pattern, this distribution. So lots of electrons at this point, none at this point, lots of electrons at this point, none at this point, lots more. So this bumpy pattern that looks very much like the waves. So that might be the answer that we call an electron a particle, but in this experiment, it's like a wave. But then we can do something else with this experiment. We don't see it, but then we make an extra measurement just behind the slit. So we've seen here that it's just behind the first slit as it passes, as it goes through. So now we know which slit it passed, passed through, and then we allow it to move to the screen and we make a measurement of where it hit the screen. And so now we can sort which went through the first slit, and which went through the second slit. And when we look at all of the electrons that went through this slit, we get a pile of electrons behind that hole in the wall. And when we look at those that went through the second slit, we get another pile behind that hole in the wall. 
So the total distribution is uh, given by, by the sum of these uh, of all these hits from the electrons and looks something like this. So simply by looking at the electron and deciding which hit, uh, asking the electron which, which hole it went through, we actually change the result of our experiment. It looks different just by looking at it. We've changed the system, we've changed the electron, we've changed the experiment. So it's almost like the electron is very shy. It doesn't want to be seen. It doesn't, it doesn't want you to know uh, which slit it went through. It wants its privacy. It wants to go through the double slits on its own, in its own terms. So uh, when we look at it, it's behaving like a particle. But when we don't look at it, it's behaving like a wave. So what is it? Is it a particle or a wave? And this really comes to the point of physicists imagining the unimaginable. That, that really is the job of a physicist because these are very useful ideas, particles and waves. We're familiar with particles in our world, things like marbles or, um, or dust and things like this. We're familiar with waves. We see waves in the ocean. But when we go into the quantum world, these ideas that we bring with us from our everyday world don't quite work. So the electron doesn't, uh, nature can be how it likes. It doesn't have to be a particle. It doesn't have to be a wave. But it turns out that it's a little bit like both of them. But what we can do is that instead of thinking of the electron as just a a particle in the sense of a, a tiny little ball, like a solid ball, just a very, very small marble. What we can do is actually describe the electron instead with something called a wave function, which is basically a, a fuzzy blob uh, that we describe using lots of mathematics. And this, but this fuzzy blob means that where the blob is, is very bright, it means the electron is probably in that bright spot. But there's a small chance that we might find the electron out here in this kind of blue glow. So this says that there's still a little bit of chance that the electron might be here. And so if we take this wave function, this fuzzy blob, and we send it through the wall, send it through the double slits, then it's almost like we're allowing it to go through all the different paths, to go through the top slit, to go through the bottom slit, to go through both slits at the same time, because this fuzzy blob, it can split into parts, it can morph and change shape, it can move at different speeds, it can do all kinds of things and change in different ways. It's not like our idea of the electron, it's just a small marble. And so that's the power of the wave functions to describe all of these paths. The first slit, the second slit, both slits, going through this slit, looping back around, flying over here and coming through this slit. Again, um, all of these possible paths that the electron can take contribute to uh, our description of what happens in this double slit experiment. And this is how we uh, can describe these tiny objects. It's not exactly a particle, it's not exactly a wave, but we can use mathematics to describe the electron, to describe how the universe works. So um, we're uh, running short on time, so I'll uh, skip this question, but uh, I want you to think about how you would describe this system. So. Uh, we have a wall with two slits in it. So one thing that you might measure is how far apart these two holes are. That might change how the electron behaves. And if we want to use maths to understand how the electron moves, we need to consider the energy of its motion. So, so we're thinking about how it moves. We need to know how fast it's going. This gives us the energy of the electron, but we also need to consider its environment. So the environment would be coming across a wall and then it finds that the wall has holes 
and then it hits a screen. So this is the environment and there might be other things happening in the environment, other things to, to hit or interact with. And so if we consider these two things, then we can describe with mathematics how the electron moves. And so this is called the Schrodinger equation and it's very complicated and something that if you continue on with your um, maths classes and uh, do physics in the future, you'll learn how to, how to use this equation to describe these tiny quantum particles. So uh, we've discovered this amazing mystery with the double slit experiment, the idea that electrons or, or light or other, other tiny particles in the universe actually sometimes look like particles and sometimes they look like waves. There's sort of something in between. And so we need to use mathematics and the wave function to actually describe how uh, it's behaving in these very odd ways, these very uh, ways that are unlike anything we see in our everyday life. There are lots of other mysteries. For example, uh, quantum tunneling. This is what allows stars to produce carbon and lots of other elements that give rise to uh, life on Earth. This was all made possible by quantum processes happening in stars. Many of you will have an interest in exoplanets. We can learn about exoplanets by getting a chemical signature because different elements uh, send out light at very specific energies. This gives us a chemical fingerprint of the planet. We also have the uncertainty principle, which says that you uh, can't know exactly where you are and how fast you're going at the same time. If you uh, know exactly where you are, you could be traveling at any speed. Uh, this, is, this is how the world works for quantum particles. And there's another uncertainty principle which allows particles to be created and then destroyed in very short times. And so that's what you see here. This is what a physicist calls nothing. Nothing is actually very busy with lots of particles being created and then destroyed. And this is based on quantum physics that allows this to happen. So the universe works in very mysterious ways. Um, so we've, we've really explored the, the double slit experiment and the, the way they can behave as particles and waves, but there are also these four mysteries and many more. Uh, so quantum mechanics is a, is a fascinating and mysterious topic. It's also responsible for transforming society in ways that have given us computers and the internet all rely on quantum physics, as well as great potential for the future with quant, uh, quantum computers making calculations much, much faster than uh, regular computers we have today. So quantum physics is, is a very uh, important uh, idea and topic for the future. So I hope that uh, in seeing some of these mysteries, you have uh, seen a, a, a new way to understand what makes up everything you see around you in the universe. And it is also quite fascinating that the quantum world, these tiny particles behave very differently, but when you put them all together and they, um, they, they act together on larger scales, the scales that we interact with every day, then we get the classical world. Um, and so there's this difference between the strange behavior of small scales actually explains and gives rise to normal for us behavior of the classical world that we experience. So uh, this is what uh, imagining the unimaginable is really all about, finding unique ways to think about things that are very foreign and very different and very hard to describe, such as the smallest particles in our universe. So thank you for uh, listening and uh, I hope you've learn something and uh, happy to take any questions.